All right, everybody. How you doing? Another edition of Chats with Coach Doug, and I've got right here. Sorry, I got to go this way. <laughs> My good friend, uh, who I've known for actually better part of 12 years, uh, Brian Mudrick uh, from TSN, uh, Canadians commentator, uh, color commentator, and sometimes Ottawa Centers uh, commentator. There you go. Exactly. The, guy, the pride of Boyle, Alberta, otherwise known as, uh, well, where Jay Onrate also lived and was born and raised, but you're a much bigger star than that guy. I mean, he just, you know, he's the long of it. You're maybe the short, medium size of it. Dan O'Toole would be the short of it, right? So, it's pretty anyway. tough, Doug, when I'm from a town of 850 people and I'm not even the biggest star to come out of there. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, oh, man. Well, it was, it was funny. Jay, Jay, uh, Jay lived in Boyle. Uh, he wasn't born there, but he lived in Boyle until I think grade six, and then he moved to Athabasca, which is nearby where I was born. Right. And uh, we've been family friends uh, for a really long time, and I know his parents really well. And uh, his sister, obviously, his sister actually married one of my cousins forever. Um, and Joanne, his mom, and my dad, Robert, played in a Ukrainian rock band called the Rainbow Riders in northern Alberta. You can't make this shit up, man. It was. Uh, you can't make that up. Yeah. Oh, man. That would have been. Dude, that is some fantastic stuff, you know? That's really kind of cool. But I will tell you this. I know this for a fact. You are a way better golfer than Jay Henry. <laughs> I don't uh, think Jay golfs. So that's there you go. Hard. So, you know, exactly, right? He's missing out. He's missing out. Exactly. Well, listen, can't thank you enough for coming on to the, uh, tonight, bud. Like, uh, it's been a while since you and I have connected, uh, but it's great to see you. I mean, you've uh, uh, you've you've – moved up a little bit from from covering the people chucking rocks and and now you're now you got the uh, the other kind of ice where it's that fast moving puck game and uh how did you find that transition well i'm still covering the people of chucking rocks curling uh i still do the season of champions on tsn and i love it uh curling was a huge break uh breakout for me back in 2009 and uh i've been doing that uh since i think my first scotties was 2009 victoria jennifer jones won that year and then um plug it along ever since and I love the roaring game but Doug I'll be honest you know uh having that opportunity two years ago to start being the voice of uh the Montreal Canadiens for TSN regional games has been uh it, wow I mean there's really no words that can describe uh how honored and uh, humbled I am every time I walk into the Bell Center and call a game I love it uh it is amazing it was a lot of hard work and uh I mean it's an iconic franchise and I don't even it in general it is an iconic franchise and uh, I still like take time and get goosebumps I walk up in the rafters to go to the broadcast booth not only to call these legends that have played for the team before and you see the banners and the numbers hanging but the broadcasters that have called the Habs and you have Danny Gallivan when the media elevators open up up there and you know the great Bob Cole who called Habs games forever as well and and recently obviously retired uh, Bobby Cole so you know, what a, what a great, it's really uh, amazing to watch because, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, you have the hockey teams that are the iconic ones in the NHL, the Leafs, the Habs, the Bruins, you know, the original six kind of stuff, right? Even though you grew up in Edmonton, you had the Oilers, you know, through their heyday and all that stuff and Gretzky, you know, just to be in that environment, and that kind of organization to be around it. And it's like, it's, it, it, like you said, it must be like pinch myself. Is this really real? Because I mean, having known you for like the last 12 years and watch you go from, you know, primarily curling Olympics, you know, on the front desk of, of, of sports center, which you did a, a fantastic job with. And, and then to get this opportunity, I mean, you, you kind of have there been moments where you're kind of sitting there looking around before a game kind of going, Holy smoke, some kid from Boyle. Look where I am. Like, wow. You know, I've tried to, you know, I find in this career and just the lifestyle and how it is, you're constantly pushing yourself. You put a lot of pressure on yourself, or at least I do. You're always striving because I talked to somebody I respect dearly, uh, Chris Cuthbert, and I was lucky enough to pick his brain a couple times. And, you know, and there is no perfect game. And you can't chase a perfect game. And, you know, even if you thought you were great, you probably weren't that great. And as bad as you thought it might have been one night, it probably wasn't that bad. So it's trying to keep things in perspective, Doug. And, and for me in life, I think uh, one of my biggest things I've discovered the last few years, um, my brother sadly passed away recently. And, and sorry. you know, through my self-discovery, it's been um, be kind to yourself. You know what? It, 
put the work in, which, which I do, and I, and I prep, and I study, and I've always promised that no one would ever outwork me. I may not be the most talented guy or voice or et cetera, but no one would ever outwork me at this job. And, and you know, it, it's come with a lot of hard work and sacrifice and, you know, missing holidays. And I don't even know what a holiday is anymore when it comes to, oh, is it Victoria? Is it a long weekend? Wait, is it, you know, I work Today's Monday, here. right? Or no, today's Wednesday? No, like who today's knows what day it is now, man. Monday. I totally I agree. Monday today. T. Tonight's tea night. Mondays is drink tea. Mondays drink tea. Well, you know what? It, it It's an amazing, uh, I mean, that's just a great little insight into your character. And I mean, one of the things that you and I instantly had when you met me at Brayben, when I was the director of golf there, we instantly had a friendship that was like bigger than golf. And it's like, we'd talk, we'd go out, we'd, we'd you know, we'd, we'd have dinner or we'd like, you know, play golf somewhere else. And, and it was an instant bond because your character of being a very humble person um and i think what i really admired with you and and why i'm not surprised where you are is just you know the outwork and i'd like to get into that a little bit later but i have some other questions that i want to talk to you about because that's a really interesting point and i want to kind of dovetail that off into like career work how you've gotten there and 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 i'd love to ha get some advice back for some young people that i coach and stuff like that because again you are a leader. You do motivational speaking. You have an amazing charity, uh, uh, Brian Mudrick Golf Classic, that, you know, it's raised $1.8 for the Cross Center Cancer Research in, in Edmonton. And they are responsible with saving your life twice. Uh, in set, when you were 17 and 19, you had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And, I mean, the real, you know, being a cancer survivor and, and all those things that you've experienced throughout your life and this raising the money for the, for the Cross Center – it's just a reflection of who you are. So, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat. I mean, I don't want everybody to think you're just an amazing dude, even more than you already are. But hey, listen, I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want, I want everybody getting the wrong message here. My gosh. <laughs> well, you, you've seen, you, I'm, I'm, I'm humble because you've beaten me at the golf course so many times, Doug. Like you got, you have to eat your pie sometimes. And a fellow lefty, I may add, who uh, makes it look very easy out there. So there you go. I, right. Right. And, uh, you know, what? I, I really think that's, uh, I mean, golf is such a wonderful game. And I mean, you're playing out of the Summit Golf Club and uh, another, you know, run by a guy with another great haircut like me, uh, <laughs> Ian Leggett. Um, but I think you would agree, before we get into this deep chat, I think you and I would both agree we need to have a little shout out. I got to actually see my dad for the first time in seven weeks. I went down to his, his uh, extended care home. He came to the balcony. I got to say, hey, dad, how are you? He's been in lockdown for seven weeks. No one's been allowed to go in. Uh, I mean, the fact that his nurses and on his floor have not allowed anything, and in his building he has had cases and people pass away, but nothing got onto his floor in these seven weeks. So a big shout out to the uh, frontline workers. Uh, and you know, I mean, without them, you know, we, you know, they're putting themselves in right in harm's way. And and you know, a big shout out from me. And I know you'd say the same. You know, I, early on when this started and, and you know, the, the NHL season just ended so abruptly and then you're just at home like everybody else going, is this really happening and what's the next step and what's going on? And, I, and I, I sent a video out to frontline workers because, Doug, when I was 17 and I had my first bout with cancer and then the second time, the relapse, I was in isolation and I basically the treatment, I had a stem cell transplant. If I would have caught anything, like a cold or any sort of virus, man, it would have been lights out. It would have been... Uh, I would have been toast. So, um, exactly. you know, for them, for the people, for the people self-isolating, for the frontline workers and the doctors and the nurses, for the for the young people that are working the grocery store for crying out loud early on, right? I mean, yeah. these are a lot of sacrifice. So I thank them, um, and, and I, I thank the big time and your little pup. Who I think that was your little pup that you. That just was my dog. Out. Yes, that was George. Yeah, yeah. They, keep, they keep you sane during these times too. So you're Doug. I, I echo those those sentiments to you, and I I mean. I haven't seen my parents in uh, probably, well, since Christmas. So it's been and really I know you're super tight with them, and I know that must be just bugging the crap out of you. So let's get on a little bit of a sports question. Let's change the subject. Let's go uh, – let's get a little deeper here. So, you know, dude, sports has just been decimated. I mean, you see all the pro athletes. I mean, I had, um, I had Joey Hishon from – who used to play for the uh, Avalanche, uh, who, who's general manager of the uh, um, Owen Sound Attack. I had him out on uh, the other day, and, you know – it, he's staying in contact with all his players from his team and stuff, right? And, I mean, you know, you hear about the LPGA and the PGA rescheduling their seasons. But, you know, I even heard Rod Smith talk about this. I turned on TSM one day, and Rod Smith was saying, realistically speaking, you know, the NHL may not come back until there's a vaccine. 
because can they really afford in the closeness of team sport like this where you're hitting people and all that stuff and if somebody's asymptomatic and all these things all those protocols that have to be in place not to mention the arenas empty right what are your thoughts on professional sport returning and like in a safe way versus you know coming back too soon like i'd love to know what your thoughts are on this well you know first and foremost i think we all miss it and i think mm -hmm. during any tragedy or thing that we've gone through in life i think to 9 11 which i remember like yesterday i was a young sports reporter in winnipeg and when when sport came back it was such a healing thing and right now there is no sports unless you're watching you know the 87 canada cup or reruns of games right? Wait, it's replay central yeah but i mean so for me i remember talking with mike johnson and dave poolin and we were right before this we we called the game in montreal it was nashville montreal on a tuesday on the thursday buffalo was in town and on Wednesday night, I think the NBA, it, it shut down, or the Tuesday night, it was shut down. They shut it down. The NHL soon followed. We were supposed to fly to L.A., San, uh, San Jose, and Anaheim for the West Coast Swing for the Habs. And at the time, we remember, San Jose was a hot spot. And we were thinking, oh, man, what's it going to be like to call NHL games with no fans? Like, can you imagine? Like, we'll be the first to ever do that. Like, not, and not that that's something I would want on my LinkedIn resume, but it's just like, wow, that could happen. And it went from thinking about that to, like, no games and then the season suspended and so to the long answer doug is is sadly i don't know um and you hear i i listen to our hockey insiders on tsn which are smarter than i am and and there's talk of four or five hub cities toronto's been rumored to be one of them edmonton's been rumored to be one of them and maybe you pack in eight ten teams however it might work do the testing and maybe you try finish the regular season and then do and then as the playoffs opened up and now they're talking about maybe having a modified draft in June well the problem with that if you're an Ottawa Senators fan watching this well we got the San Jose pick in the first round Ottawa could have two top top picks with Alexi Lafreniere up for grabs this year and, and maybe one of the most talented you know top 10 drafts in a while so there's so many unanswered questions and then and then how about if you made it trade with Pittsburgh and the condition was if we made the second round you get a first round pick so all that stuff right um and at the end of the day man it comes down to trusting our medical people uh I want to get back to work like oh man as bad as the next person I really do and and to be honest Doug my season would have ended anyways I do the under 18 World hockey championship I always do that in April end of April that was in Plymouth Michigan and it was obviously canceled. And then normally I would do a couple Hockey Canada things, maybe a couple fill-in sports centers in the summer. But I'd really be off till September, you know, 15th NHL preseason. And now after, you know, not seeing my parents, not being able to see anybody really, I'm self-isolating, you know, at home with my new dog. But man, like I would give anything to go back to work tomorrow. Like, and, and, and not have a holiday and just work right through and get rid of this, you know? Yeah. yeah. I had one of those. I grew it. Uh, first two and a half weeks uh, of this, and then I said, oh, my gosh, I aged, like, 10 years, right? Because, like, uh, it actually brought me closer to my real age, and I looked like my dad. I was like, whoa, I'm shaving this thing off. I'm like, no way. So uh, shockingly, Doug, like men, like, men are, like, think I should just keep this, the, the, um, the Bushman look, and I might. Why not? People like the look. I don't know. What do you think? Should I save this look or go back to old Mudsy? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, listen. Well, I like old Mudsy. Uh, he's uh, he's a lot nicer. Uh, he's a lot better looking too. <laughs> no, but um, uh, Joe Thornton shaved off his beard, right? I saw that. Yeah. So I mean, uh, oh, I got a little unstable uh, internet connection. You know, Joe Thornton. You know, he shaves off his beard, and you know, it's crazy. Um, so here's an interesting thing. So golf, I know, is a passion of yours. And right now you'd be like right out on the golf course. You know, you'd kind of be in your, your off season working on the game. And you, you originally were at uh, Scarborough and you've since moved to Summit. Uh, and it's a great track. One of my favorites uh, in the GTA. And you play off a six handicap. Dude, you, you don't hit it out of your shadow. But man, you know how to roll, the, uh, the, roll that rock on the, on the greens. Your short game is just phenomenal. How do you, how do you attest the fact that you know you're a six handicap but like can i'd still lose money to you because like you seem to find a way to win all the time what do you attest that to 
being a stubborn Ukrainian? I don't know. Um, I think golf, Dougie, you've, you've coached it. You've played it for years. It's your livelihood. I, I think, I think golf's confidence and it's a mindset. I mean, and I think like I look at sports broadcasting, it's very competitive and, you know, not a lot of people, you know, get to do it. I get to do. And I, and trust me, I, number one, I feel privileged, but I've also earned it. You know what? I've worked really hard to get to where I am and I've given up a lot to get to where I am. And golf is a lot of the same. You gotta, you have to be stubborn. You gotta put your mind to it, stick to a plan, keep grinding, don't quit. Um, and then there's some days, the harder you try, you're just, you're still garbage. So, um, but we haven't played in a while, man. I'm hitting, I'm, well, I'm hitting a, a draw now slash, uh, snap hook. So I actually okay. I off the tee quite a bit farther. Uh, and I've gotten, cause when I played with you, man, I was always a nine, eight or a nine, but I've gotten, I've gotten it down to about a six depends like five. I shot, um, my best round ever. I shot at Scarborough. I shot two under, uh, on a Tuesday morning with, with our usual Tuesday morning group. And my handicap went from an eight to like a two. <laughs> and I'm not a two. Man. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Holy so cow. I, yeah, that was, that was, and I just love the game, man. And you know what I missed? And I, I, you can speak to this. No one cares what you shot a second after even me. I don't care. But like, I miss my buddies. I miss the camaraderie. I miss walking outside a beautiful place, shutting your brain off. And then, and then on the patio with a great bottle of wine with the boys after, right? Like that is what I am like missing. We do a, a zoom call with a bunch of us on Tuesday nights and just, and we have a glass of wine and, and just catch up, man. And, and right. Like that's golf's great. Don't get me wrong, but I really miss everything that goes along with it and taking 20 bucks from your buddy that you can never take 20 off. Like that's, nice. that's what I miss. That's, you know what, that's a great point. And, and it's really the joy uh, that golf has given you, right? Mm. It reaches really deep. And one of the things I love that you've done with golf is, you know, you got the idea for the Brian Mudrick Golf Classic. And when you started this, you know, you, again, we mentioned a little bit at the beginning and we, we talked about it, but like, it's really been such a wonderful um, charity and, and tournament and it's grown. Right. And I mean, it's something that you really, yeah, but this year, you know, you got to give it a second thought. Cause yeah, no, right. We, Cause, um, yeah, it was going to be so long story short. Uh, I never, I can never shorten stories, but uh, we did it for 15 years and we were going to shut it down. And this was two summers ago, time flies, maybe three summers ago. And it was our 15th. And my goal back when I was, when I was going through my chemotherapy and my mom wheeled me out of that hospital, I remember, she loves the story. And I just said, mom, I'm going to raise a million bucks for this place someday. And she says, why don't you put on 10 pounds first? And, um, and when I got to CTV Edmonton, I was 21 at the time. And, uh, and we started the golf tournament the first year we raised 30,000. And then, and then as the years went on, it got bigger and better. And I, I, I incorporated what I love about golf, fun, a great time, uh, laughing, awesome people. I mean, we had a DJ at every like third hole, we had volleyball. We had like, it was a part, it was basically a, a celebration and a party with some golf. That's, that's how I describe my golf tournament. And I think that's why people loved it and really great. You didn't have to be a golfer. You could come and you'd have a blast and it didn't matter who won. It didn't matter what you shot. Everyone had a great time with it. So we raised uh, the million and we just kept going because it was going great. And we had the sponsorships. And then my brother was sadly diagnosed with a really awful cancer and uh he passed away um just over a year ago and he was our guest speaker at our last tournament and um so we my mom and i and my family decided to have one more in his memory and we're going to raise money for knight's cabin which helps kids and families after cancer retreats food nutrition mental health like helping uh families and people out and we're going to donate the other half to the uh the cancer care uh center for seniors in Boyle. so but with the economy and i mean oh my goodness alberta has just been decimated economy oil prices fort mcmurray's had the floods where i'm kind of near the, that's near my hometown and you just you can't like the people are trying to feed their families like you can't do a charity golf tournament and logistically it'd be kind of a nightmare so we're just postponing it one year and hoping we can have one for my brother uh next summer well that would be a wonderful way to come out of all this uh in his honor right i mean you know what it's uh it again it just continues the giving that you've done and used golf as a vehicle for that um and it's such a you know it was such a wonderful event to begin with so to have some 
you know, to get it back going and uh, to be able to, to reach out to your people and to have them come back and enjoy it. And uh, I'm sure it will, uh, it will sell out. No, no problem whatsoever. So you, you went, so coming out of high school in Boyle, you decided you, you, you wanted to go to Nate, which Nate is the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. And you know, it's, it's in Edmonton. That's uh, Hey, that's uh, actually, it's uh, this is actually from my college, uh, the Nate RTA 50th year. There wow, you go. Big way. go that, yeah, what are the chances, right? There you go. I got you on your tea night and, your drink, and, and you're, you're using the mud. Yeah. Amazing. It's like it was planned. Um, <laughs> so what was your motivation going into broadcasting? Like where, who was the catalyst that said, you, you know what, I really, you know what, I want to do that. And, and, and where did you get the spark? So I love sports, uh, Doug, my whole life. I grew up playing on a nine-hole golf course with sand greens. You used to have to rake the greens around before we got grass greens. That's how old I am. Um, you know, you play basketball, volleyball, golf, uh, anything you could in a small town, curling, right? There's, uh, when you're from a town of 850 people, there's not a lot to do. And I was lucky enough to grow up by a lake. So, you know, we could go ice fishing with my grandpa on the boat in the summertime, whatever. So I always loved sports, and I was not blessed with the 95-mile-an-hour left-handed arm. I was a pretty good baseball player many, many years ago, and I got to play in the Little League Nationals um, one year, which was great. And uh, I got to go to uh, the Atlanta Braves. They'd always have scouts in Western Canada through some of the Team Alberta stuff, so I got to go to one of those. And it was funny. They grade you as a Major League Baseball player, and I was, like, below average in every category. <laughs> so a uh, true story right I mean I, I listen I was trying to make community college or maybe have a chance to get a partial scholarship and play in the states so while I was I was 17 and going through these motions um I felt a lump in my neck and uh three days later we had a biopsy and it was cancer and I was blown away I was also naive I thought I'll oh, give me some Advil what do I got to do here and uh and I actually, after chemotherapy, I went to one of the tryouts and I was throwing up in center field and I'm like, what am I doing? This is um, ridiculous. And at the time, uh, I, had, I already had the passion for broadcasting. Um, so I would, when I was 16, I would drive to Edmonton, which is about an hour and 40 minutes from Boyle, and I would volunteer at Shaw Cable. And they allowed me to like pull cable, cameras, audio, whatever, get coffee, I, like whatever you could do to get some experience. And that helped me with my resume to get into Nate because for every 500 kids that applied, I think 30 got in. So I was wow. lucky enough to get into Nate in the program. But the first day of the program was my first day of chemotherapy. So we sent my dad because I didn't want to miss first day. And to this day, my buddy is Chris Durham. He's the teacher there still. And Chris, after pulled my dad aside and said, well, sir, uh, Mr. Uh, Mudrick, Mr. Murdoch, you're a little old to be uh, in this class. And my dad laughed and explained, you know, why, you know, I, I was there for me. So I was actually going through my first, first battle of cancer and chemo and radiation while I was also going to Nate. So that was a really tough battle. But again, being stubborn, I still uh, redshirted on the volleyball team and I curled on the curling team. And when I had my second relapse, so, sorry, the second time when it came back, my relapse, I suppose. Thank God there was a second relapse. I had a Broviac tube in my neck, and it would basically old school come into your chest, so you wouldn't have to give you needles all the time. It would just do the plastic boom, and it would go in. And I delayed my, my uh, going to the hospital to be in isolation for a month so I could curl in provincials. But I had to duct tape um, the Broviac tube to my chest so I could sweep. And what was worse is that um, at the time, I was in my practicum, at CKS Lloyd Minster, and they let me go, but I had to call in radio reports, and we lost every game. We lost every game, and I had to call back and, <laughs> and another loss, and my skip's name was Taylor Field. Imagine that. I think their parents are Rump Riders fans. So Taylor Field's team lost. Brian Mudrick is the third on that team. So anyways, I digress. I'm rambling, but... Um, no, that's a great story. Oh, my God. I can just imagine. Hurry, heart. Oh, God. Hurry, hurry. Uh, heart. Oh my gosh, man, that, that's, this is why I do what I do. I love these stories and these are great stories because here's the really interesting thing. So you, you, dude, this is like, this is crazy stuff, man. You, two bouts in two years, like you're 17, you're 19 and you're still in college and you're, you're, you, you still got your eye on the prize. And, and I mean, the really cool thing out of this is that you come out and you start working in, in Edmonton and, and, one of the things I thought about you with you was who were some of those people when you were first started 
and over the course say like from the time you graduated till you got to well since when when, when we started hanging out when you're around 30 who are those people that really pushed you in the right direction and gave you those that that kind of like the coaching you would would have gotten like kind of like if you were playing on a team I definitely I definitely had a lot of people help help me along the way I look back in the very early times there was a gentleman named uh, Ron Rimmer who taught me how to write sports highlights in Edmonton back then it was called ITV and it's now global television this is going years back and at the time, uh, Darren Millard was there, and I wrote highlights for Darren Millard for a year before he went to Sportsnet, which started up, I think, in 99, 98 or 99. Right. Um, and so he, he really helped me early on. Um, Roger Millions was great to me at CTV Edmonton when I was a Nate student. Uh, he answered a lot of my questions and was always there for me and would look at my demo tapes. Uh, he was really, really good to me um, at a young age. And to be, to be honest, uh, Doug, I was really self, I didn't need any motivation, man. When you were told that you may not make your 21st birthday and the second time you may not come away with your life, you don't need any more motivation. Um, I was, I was a pretty big driver of my own engine and I was very determined and, and I knew what I wanted to do and I definitely got help, but I also had to make my own breaks and I was very determined, uh, to get there. And I, I always, you know, Masai Ujiri a couple of years ago, or maybe it wasn't that long, was asked about pressure, about the job he has. And he goes, you know where I'm from? Pressure is wondering if you can feed your family or keep them alive or keep them safe. That's pressure, right? What I do and, and what he, I mean, I can't speak for him. What I do, man, it's, yeah, is it pressure? I guess, but it's like, it's awesome and it's fun and it's adrenaline and it's exactly what I signed up for. That's awesome. And you know what? That's really great about the pressure part because you know, one of the things I picked up from you is that, hey, you need to put in the reps. You need to put in the behind the scenes work. You need to do put up unseen shots like like Steph Curry would do or, 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 or Kobe in the gym at three in the morning, putting up shots that nobody sees, working on the footwork that nobody nobody sees. You're watching play. the last dance with Jordan? I mean. I'm all right. Oh, yeah. 100%. Like, like right? you want to talk about crazy work ethic and drive. I mean. Right. Oh. Right. And that was in my heyday. I had a pair of Air Jordan 1s. You're talking about my absolute icon, like, in my bucket list of people to play with. He is my number one uh, number one in my foursome. Like, I want to play golf with Michael Jordan. Join his course. Nick Mickelson's joining. You should join. Take me. There you go. Exactly. The best part about this is, is that you, like, people think, okay, what's, how hard is sportcasting? Really, honestly, truly. Because, like, they see you guys out there and they think, hey, look, you're a good-looking cat. Hey, you got to interview some people and all that stuff, man. On camera persona is not easy, and it takes a lot of time to do this. Some people are get in front of a camera and they freeze. What, what were some of the things that you used to practice, or what were some of the advice that somebody gave you to to really help you with your on air person personality and 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 to make sure it was really pointed? I, and this will you can take it for what you want. If it makes me sound or look conceited, I don't even care. I, I, I watch everything I do or a ton of it. If I have the opportunity, I will literally call a hockey game, especially early on. And I'll watch the game front to back the next day. And I will literally write down Doug, if I said dumps it in deep too many times, or if I use a, if I get a, on a phrase, I'm, I'm kind of like, it's a crutch phrase that I'm saying too often. And I will actually physically, okay, I, I got to avoid these and I'll open a thesaurus and say, how can I say that phrase? And Doc Emmerich is a genius at that. Like if you watch Doc call a game, he never uses the same vocabulary. It's always fresh or different. And I think one of the biggest things I would tell young broadcasters listening, um, be yourself. Uh, don't try to be um, funny like Jay Onright and Dan O'Toole. Don't try to be me. Be yourself. Uh, be right. who you are and find out what makes you great and um, pretend you're having a conversation, you know, and, and with, and it's funny. Uh, I would say calling NHL hockey, it's, it's tough because you have to know when to let your analysts talk, when to let the crowd, um, you know, build up the hype, when to weave in a story or an interesting fact, when that player has the puck and you know, that player is going to start a scoring chance. And the NHL so fast, you can get away with it. Maybe in junior, I do the under 18s. Maybe you can get away with it a bit more. It can turn like this on a dime. So you better be careful. You're telling some story about 
Keith Yandel's Ironman streak, and the next thing you know, boom, Max Domi still the fuck scores. Like, um, and people, I laugh. They go, "So you read a teleprompter up there? Like, what? Do you, how do you know it's <laughs> teleprompter? Saying? What's that? Come on! Well, wow! Uh, but I it can't believe they actually yeah. think that. That's like, that's crazy. Even I know that, and I'm a golf basketball guy. I mean, there's no teleprompting in that. You're calling it as it comes, man. I mean, that it takes a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, art to be able to put it together. And I love the fact that you say, "Hey, you know what? See, those are the things that." I think separate the best from others. And it goes, it goes hand in hand. I remember uh, this, I, I had this wonderful chance to talk to a speaker uh, a couple weeks ago. His name's Alan Stein Jr. He was, uh, he trained Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, Markel Fultz, uh, basketball trainer, now motivational speaker. He tells this great story of being a coach at the very first Kobe Bryant camp when Steph Curry as a freshman at Davidson was there. They only thought Steph was at the camp because he was Dell's son. And then he was always off the bus first, laced up an hour ahead in the gym, getting shots up. All these other guys didn't get started ready until 15 minutes before. At the end of the very first practice, Alan Stein Jr. has coach on the back of his, his, his T-shirt, and he's helping. And Steph Curry comes up and says, Coach, can you rebound for me? He goes, why? He goes, I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish. Now, four swishes, one back rim, still goes in, mathematically okay, but not a swish. Didn't take him more than 12 to 14 minutes to get five swishes before he left the gym. Those types separ are the separators. So to hear you talk about rewatching your game is why you are where you are. And I love that. And it's, a, it's just a point I wanted to say that the, the differentiators in better players, whether you're a pro basketball player, a pro sportscaster, okay, or a golf coach, what are you doing to make yourself better, right, all the time? As my hashtag says, better never stops. So really cool, fun part of my talks is this next part. You don't know what's coming. Fast five, I got five questions for you. You answer them as best as you can, my boy. All right? Number do one. I have a, whoa, do I, so do, I get a, do I get a pass at all or do I have to answer? No, that? you're not allowed to pass any of them. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's okay. a clean show. It's a clean show. <laughs> Name your bucket list foursome and what course? Oh, wow. Okay. Cyprus. I've never even thought, I should have thought of this and I've never thought of it. Probably Cyprus. Good job. Um, and who would I want to golf with? Um, Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods, Tupac. Oh, I love Tupac. That's a great reference. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, mama. There we go. All right, cool. I might change that like in an hour. I just threw that out there. I don't know. That's okay. That's okay. What's your favorite brand of golf equipment to play? Uh, I probably like I've hit TaylorMade irons since I can remember. So like irons, TaylorMade. Cool. For, yeah. Right on. All right. In a putting contest between you, Ben Crenshaw, Tiger, and Brad Faxon, who wins? <laughs> Uh, Jack Nicholas <laughs> coming out of retirement at eighty to beat all five of you. To beat oh, all I thought we're talking like oh, you mean like currently? Yes. I wanted to throw my oh, said so no. Uh, Tiger. Mm, you. He's got nothing to do but putt right now. There's nothing going on. True. And his practice really is pretty awesome. I've seen it from. Uh, I've seen the pictures. <laughs> it's pretty good. All right. Who's your favorite sports hero? Man. Uh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I have to tell the story behind it, but I'm, I'm going to go with Wayne, I'm going to go with Wayne Gretzky. Awesome. But this, I haven't told a quick story. So I haven't met Chris Cuthbert or Ray Ferraro before. And I, I, and we were in Edmonton. I think I was doing something currently. I forget, but I'm in Edmonton and I'm at this pub of my buddies and I'm with a bunch of my awesome girlfriends that actually volunteer at my golf tournament. And I just worked with Ray Ferraro in Prague. So I would have been 2015. So maybe this is 2016. So I knew Ray. So I'm with my, my buddies. We're having a drink, whatever. And, and, and my friend Brooke, um, awesome, beautiful lady, she looks over like, oh, my God, Brian, that's Wayne Gretzky in the corner. That's Wayne Gretzky. And I look over. I'm like, holy crap, that's Chris Cuthbert. I've never met Chris Cuthbert. <laughs> I, I was like, wow. Like, 
And so, and they're like, oh my God, you gotta go. Got, and I'm like, well, that's Ray Ferraro too. That's cool. So I know Ray, I, like I, Ray would know who I am at least. And I'm working at TSN, but I've just never met Chris. And I would just assume Chris had no idea who I was, but you know, obviously he did. He's such a nice guy. So finally I go, okay, let me just let him, let's, let me go feel it out and see. So, okay. Hey guys. And Ray's like, Hey Brian, and Chris, so nice to meet you. Hi Wayne, nice to meet you. And we chat and actually Wayne Gretzky talked about the uh, Olympic curling in 2010. Very nice man. And I, and finally, I, I was like, when I'm so sorry, uh, it didn't help that the girls were all pretty good looking. There was about five of them. Like those ladies over there would love a photo. I, you're probably the 70th time you've been asked today. And they're all like, Ooh. and he's like, oh yeah, no problem. Come on over. So they come over, they line up with Wayne. I take the photo and I, I think it was a Blackberry. I had a type of book. Great. They're all so excited. They run away. And I go, Wayne, can you take a photo of me and Chris Cuthbert? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, yeah, the golden goal. Well, obviously, he laughs, and he takes a photo of Chris Cuthbert and I. Oh, my gosh. That is a great story. Oh, my God. And like, oh, my gosh, dude. That is fantastic. Well, you know what? That, that is worth the story to wait for. All right. Last question. What is the name of the Brian Mudrick book? Keep on keeping on. Love it. That's a great, great title. Awesome. All right. So I did a little digging, as I have to do when I'm interviewing you, because normally you're interviewing or you're asking the questions. It's a little flipped on you now. So one of my favorite drinks, okay, is just a straight, you know, vodka on the rocks. I love vodka. And you know what? I do recall actually drinking a few with you back in the day and all that stuff, right? But the, the, the thing is, you have... A hundred dollar taste in vodka with a, but you only really have a five dollar budget. And the really interesting thing here is, I found out that it wasn't actually Grey Goose that you were serving us <laughs> when we would come over to the to the condo. Um, and in fact, you were up to a little bit of uh, smoke and mirrors there, Mr. Mudrick. I might even have it. So actually, you. We did it once as a joke, as a party. You actually got the actual Grey Goose. Um, but for my, for my cheaper friends who would never bring anything over ever, and after the 70th time of that, we actually we had the uh, Oso Negro vodka from Mexico. And I actually, <laughs> my mom uses this to clean her toilets. This probably retails uh, for about, I don't know, 30 pesos, um, which might be 30. No, it, this was probably like five bucks Canadian. Anyway, so, um, yeah, we had, uh, that was the old thing. Wait a second, I think I have a big bottle of egg on here. The shelf needs to be, look at that, that's a big, that's a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> but you would pour that into the Grey Goose bottle. But I would, but I even told my old roommate Paul at the bottom, there'd be a black, and he was so stupid, there'd be a black X, and that was the one that, don't <sighs> drink that, you, you live here, you don't have to. And he, would, he wouldn't even care. He wouldn't look at the bottom of this, whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Guilty, guilty as charged. Well, he oh, man. Put that... a bottle of wine over sometime, even if it's like box wine, and you'll get the good. I'm a generous, hey, I'm a generous guy. Hey, if you receive, you're willing to give, right? Mm. It, it's, it's a nice two-way street, right? And you know what, dude? I've been in that condo. It's worth, it's worth a bottle of wine for the view alone so i mean come on anyway well, thank you sir thank you very no, much no absolutely 100 percent. so one of the things that i've always I, i've done it only i think twice in my life curling is freaking hard okay it's not easy and it's a lot harder than it than it looks those guys and those pros make it look super super easy right i compare a curler's ability to to make shots to get the correct weight and the break and you know how the ice curves and the intern or out turn of the rock, it's like, it's not unlike putting, okay? But there's, you know, what are some of these unknowns about curling that, you know, we just don't realize how good these people are? Because to watch it is amazing, some of these shots, and I just don't know how they do it. What are some of the things that you've seen that are just like, that separates these guys and how good they are? I think a lot of it is what we've talked about, uh, Doug. It's, it's what you don't see is the work they put in the gym. Uh, behind the scenes, the thousands of rocks they throw, maybe they work as uh, a lawyer or a salesman or whatever. And then during their lunch break, they're going down to the rink to throw a hundred rocks when they, on their lunch break. And, you know, I really believe since it's become an Olympic sport, 
I mean, it's, it's taken seriously. I mean, we laugh, you see some of the old videos of a guy who's got a dart hanging out of his mouth and he's, you know, coming down the ice and throwing the stone. But I mean, it's, I'm telling you, man, it's, it, it is a, a tough sport. And I think of the recent briar that we just had in Kingston and Brad Jacobs team who Olympic gold medalists and those guys are in great shape. They had to play, it would have been something like four games in a row with a tiebreaker to make the playoffs. And if you think it's a joke, go sweep 10 ends. And I mean, at a high level, like not just fooling around thinking it's fun, a beer league game. Like I'm talking, these guys can, you know, they're the difference between going to the Olympics or not saving a shot or not losing a game or, or winning a game. So it's the reps. It's the hard work, uh, obviously God given talent. Right. And uh, seeing the angles it's chess. It really is like the best. Um, I look at Brendan Botcher, who's out of Alberta, who's a young guy that might be one of the best like young guys when it comes to strategy we've seen in a while. He's really good at it. And that, and that takes a lot of time. I mean, uh, Russ Howard, my buddy and my colleague, I looked at a guy like him, Kevin Martin, uh, over the years, guys who are brilliant at, at having that strategy um, to call the game and, and, and thinking, okay, if we go here, what is my opponent going to do in the next four shots? You know, so uh, a ton of respect for the, the men and women that do it. I love watching the Scotties, love the Briar. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope like everything curling will find a way to come, come back. Well, that's just it. You got to cover it in the Olympics. And I mean, that in itself must have been just absolute like a thrill to win a gold medal for your country, right? And to, to win a medal for your country, at least that, and to cover the, all the, that goes on. You've seen some of the countries have gotten a lot better at curling than they were in 2010. Is it, is it just the, the nature of the sport in the, in the evolution of where it's going, or is it, is it really people, curling is getting bigger? I would hope it's getting bigger. Um... You know, I, I think the Vancouver Olympics, and I mean, you mentioned covering the Olympics, but how about covering one in Canada, in your own country? Like that to me, Vancouver is something I will never, ever forget, ever. And exactly. when there was a chance Calgary talked about maybe putting a bid in again for, what is it, eight years from now or whatever that, I mean, I was, I mean, I get the economics and it's not for me to speak on, but like I would have been selfishly just thrilled for one more winter Olympics in Canada. But um, I think, a lot of the European teams would hire Canadian coaches. I mean, Russ Howard went over and coached Switzerland, and they won the bronze medal in, in that year. Um, uh, Marcel Rock went over to coach. Uh, Russ, uh, sorry, Glenn Howard, Russ's brother, went over to coach in Europe, uh, Eve Muirhead's team, and they've, they've had a couple of, uh, of the, some of the best that we've had in Canada go over and coach, men and women. So that's smart. Right. And I, and it's good for the game. I think if Sweden and Switzerland is, is pushing uh, Canada, that is not only great. I mean, it's only going to make the competition in this. Right. And I, you want it, you don't, you don't want certain sports to be oh these four or three countries are always in it every year. And it's no surprise. It's nice to see. And with mixed doubles now in Olympic sport, a country like Latvia that can find one sheet of ice, you only need two athletes, right? You don't have to fly travel. <laughs> And mixed doubles is a really fun sport, and it's fast, it goes by quick, and it's pretty entertaining. See, this is evolution of a sport, right? And it's really amazing to watch just how they've come up with different ideas, not to mention the equipment, the brooms, the technology, the angles, and everything they have to do to, to make this work. It's not unlike hockey, where hockey was our sport for the longest time, and it's become so much more international, and so many more people are playing, and they're you know, I mean, the kids that are coming into the league from, you know, now aren't just Canadian kids. I mean, we always think that, hey, world juniors, all that stuff, we're always going to win and all those things. But that's not the reality anymore. And it's a really interesting point. I, uh, I really think that, you know, internationally, sport has become a very much a national thing in terms of the global sport. Like, it's not just hockey as a Canadian game. Canadian hockey is a global game. It goes with basketball. It goes with all these sports. So. One of the things that I've always admired is the fact that as a, uh, as a sportscaster, okay, uh, or a broadcaster, right, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a cool job. And I remember watching when the score had Gillette's drafted, right? They, they had uh, two seasons of it. And in fact, Jackie Redman, who now works for uh, NHL, uh, NHL uh, uh, TV, um, she won. 
and went on to a pretty good career with Sportsnet and all that stuff. And it kind of was like, it was kind of very interesting to see how that, you know, reality TV, they found an actual capable broadcaster. But how about somebody who's maybe thinking about going into broadcasting? What wisdom, other than just going for it and do their homework and all that stuff, what do you think are some of the more Brian Mudrick uh, words of wisdom that you could drop on them to, to ensure that they would stay focused in, in their pursuit? Uh, don't expect to make a lot of money. Uh, I mean, early on, especially, you know, Doug, it's, it's tough. It's, um, it's a grind. It's not easy. A lot of people want to do it. Uh, there's a lot of interest in it. And of course, because it's an amazing job, I, I, it's the old saying, find something that you can do that, you know, that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's such a cliche, but it's so, so true. And I love it. So advice I would give, um, if you can find a way, volunteer, get, get some reps in, find a way to learn more about it, beg somebody to talk to you uh, that is in broadcasting to answer some questions. If you can find a bit of a mentor uh, to guide you, don't be scared to travel to small towns. It's okay to take the job in Lloydminster where I started. Uh, you're going to have to maybe move to a moose jaw or a yellow knife. Um, you're going to have to go to uh, small places if you're if, if, to get into it because they're just not handing out jobs right away in Toronto or even in Edmonton or maybe even in Regina like you're gonna have to maybe go to a smaller market um, to find your way and when I started my first job I was uh, the weather specialist which means you know nothing about weather um, and you take what I was I was the agriculture reporter and the weather specialist um, and my dad was a farmer and he dropped out of Ryerson to be meteorologist. So I had his dream job at 19. So you have to be willing to do anything. You have to be willing to, okay, I can report on this. I'll do radio if I have to. Because at the end of the day, if you're reporting on the cow prices, you're reporting on game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Telling a story is telling a story. If you can be good at telling us any story, it can be on anything. It doesn't, don't be pigeonholed into saying, oh, I only want to be a sports guy or I only want to call play by play or I only want to be a, like this person. Be, be whatever person you can because I, I look back, some of my best experience was doing the weather because you had to ad lib and you had to BS for like six minutes. And if you're wrong, you still had a job the next day, which was even better. So, I mean, that, get any experience you can. Uh, and, and like anything in life, try to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. And for me, that was easy. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and I wish you the best of luck. Well, that's amazing uh, wisdom. And I mean, I really do like the fact that you're saying, take the small job, start it. You're, you're not going to walk into something right off the bat. And I often talk about that with, uh, with young PGA professionals who are walking into this business. Hey, same thing. You're not going to make a ton of money. But if you find out what it is you want to do, focus on that, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, and you can feed off them and make yourself a better individual, you're going to come out of this a lot better because the technology for the young professional nowadays that's starting in where I was, my gosh, I've got a couple of young people that are like at 25. I go, when I was 25, I was just becoming an assistant pro. I didn't even know where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. It didn't really hit me until I was like 40. You know, coaching golf was exactly what I should have been doing all the time. So it really has a great, I mean, those are wonderful words to, to pass on to everybody. And it's one of the things I really like about what I've heard about you today uh, from you today is, is just this, this essentially like my hashtag better never stops. You're always working. You're always making yourself a better, better person. So what does the future look like once we get out of this, uh, you know, who knows when that's going to happen. But once we get back into, you know, hopefully some hockey, hopefully, you know, I'm not sure what it looks like, but, you know, where do you think Brian's going? You, you don't want to keep going with this Canadians, uh, the Canadians and see how long you can stay there and become the voice of the Canadians for years to come? I think just keep an open mind. Uh, my goal, I, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you, is to call game seven of the Stanley Cup final, preferably with two Canadian teams in it. Um, call a Briar someday, a Briar final. Call a Scotty's final. Call uh, Olympics again, you know. Um, be, be better than I was today. You know, try to, uh, I know and I believe Chris Cuthbert and, and I really respected his advice. Uh, maybe there isn't a perfect game out there, but you can, you can damn well try and you can keep chasing it. And for the record, I asked him 
um, cause he's, I mean, he is someone I grew up watching and admired. And I said, okay, so if there's no perfect game, what's one that you look back on and, and uh, that you enjoyed? And he kind of smiled and he said, uh, yeah, that, uh, that golden goal game, that worked out pretty well. That, yeah, that, I would say that and, worked out uh, pretty that well. Was, uh, yeah, true, right? Yeah, I mean, what, a, what, a, what an iconic moment and what a game and what a call, right? So uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Exactly. Uh, I just think that, you know what, one of the things that y- if you find your passion, just like you said, it's never you're going to work a day in your life. And it's very evident to me, Brian Mudrick, you have your passion, you have your, your non-job, which is, keeps you smiling every day. And I can't thank you enough for uh, this. I mean, this hour goes by like this when I, when we get talking and you know what, dude, like, I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight Uh, to everybody that's tuned in. uh, This man is uh, not just uh, a wonderful broadcaster. He's an amazing human being who has done amazing things with his life and is going to continue to do so uh although he's he is doing it for the montreal canadians and that's toronto maple Leafs. <clears throat> so anyways without further ado <laughs> thank you brian mudrick i really do appreciate you coming on tonight and hanging out with me for another case of chats with coach doug that was very kind of you i was good listen what what a way to close me out i was going to send you the toilet paper for free anyways but now you're going to get a <laughs> Now you're going to get a year's supply FedEx to your house. And uh, I'm this close away from going for the Dougie haircut, man. It's start like, I don't know how much longer I can handle this. Well, as a buddy, it still looks pretty good on you. And uh, just stick around for a couple seconds. I'm going to kill these feeds. But uh, thank you so very much for, uh, for tonight. All right. Just...